And Lord, even when we're in you, not, we are not, we're not complete until we take that last breath and we're with you. Mm-hmm. But Lord, in you, we are complete because you are complete. Lord, you choose to dwell within temples not made by human hands. You dwell within us. Lord, we thank you for that privilege along with responsibility. So today, Lord, as we come to this table, as our hearts have been seasoned with worship, that, Lord, we would come back to the heart of worship. We would come back to the very heart of you, God. You love us. You care for us. You are just. You are perfect. And, Lord, in you, we become that. We become just, justified, sanctified, consecrated. And, Lord, we, we know, again, looking in the, at the person in the mirror, we are definitely all works in process. Mm-hmm. May it be works in progress that we're progressing, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, no matter how slow the process is at times, Lord. So, Lord, prepare us for what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. Well, all right, good morning. God bless you. For those of you guys who are online, I, I hope you're online. If you're not, Put the shovel down, get back in the house. <laughs> We're going to have communion, so we'll give you some time to grab your communion elements. But uh, I just want to share some things with you that happened. I, I didn't even get to, I got to the green room a little bit late, so I, but I, I just want to share some things for devotion as we prepare our hearts this morning. You know, uh, it's because he is the way, I am made new. Made new. Uh, Isn't that great? I mean, we can see that the Lord sets us free, or does the Lord make us free? When you look at that, at that uh, the verse in the Bible, it's He makes us free. I mean, we can go down, we can go down the street right now and grab the keys from the warden and let all of the inmates out, and we can set them free. But are they free? Have they been made free? You know, I would say no, because if they're going to go out and do the same thing that they did before, they become a repeat offender, and they're going to wind up back in there again. You know, so you can be in prison. I, you know, when I did prison ministry out of Las Vegas, there was people in there, the guys in there that I knew that were more free than when I was walking out because they were free indeed. You know, they were who they knew they were in Christ. They were the, the, the truth about who they were, humility. They walked in humility, not in shame. They walked in humility, knowing who they really are in Christ. You know, and, and today, I, you know, I, I just look at the, through the Bible, Jesus made clear statements about who he was. There was no ambiguity about his life. His mission, his purpose were all clear. He was always been clear to his people that he is love and he is all we need. In Exodus 3.14, he says something to a very nervous and apprehensive Moses. I am who I am. That's where Popeye stole the phrase. I am who I am. What was he doing? He was, in, in this uh, devotion, he says, he was filling Moses with confidence and assurance of the journey ahead. Folks, we've got a journey ahead of us, don't we? And who do we follow? We follow the great I am. We follow I am that I am. And we get that confidence from him today. So today in uncertainty, we still find these clear statements that he makes. He declares the truth about who he is. And his identity, these are our declarations that shape our identity because who he says he is and us in him is who we are in him, through him, for him, and by him. Amen? I mean, I want to, you know, this room might not be filled, but I'm going to preach like it is. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And for those of you who are watching online, hoop and holler, get, get excited because you are free indeed. You are made new in Jesus Christ. You know, again, you guys hear me talk about our town and, and the things that go on and hot August nights and streets of thunder and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, and it's great to go out and see these vehicles and see them restored, redeemed from the garbage pit, so to speak. Made new. You know, there's something about making something new. Making something new. And, you know, I don't know a guy or a gal who restores vehicles that does it cheaply they spend 10 times more than that vehicle's actually worth when it was new they put the best of the best of the best jesus looks at us he he put the best in us the best in us himself amen we are made new 
As we move forward and discover more and more who we are in Christ, we become more and more confident. The I am's, the I am's become our truth. They become our truth. If we can have the deacons come forward, ushers come forward, we're going to pass the communion elements, and I'm going to have you guys repeat some things before we, before we take communion together. But Lord, we just come before you, and we want to celebrate this table with you. We want to know that, that Lord, that, that uh, we can be confident in who you make us because of the confidence that we have in who you are. In Jesus' name, Lord. As these elements are passed, Lord, we ask you to bless them. Bless them, Lord. As we would take a piece of bread, take a cup cup of grape juice, and, and see what you did at a communion table. For the disciples then to fulfill the, the Old Testament laws and to become what we know to be the salvation that we walk in. The bread of life. The cup of redemption. The water of the word. In Jesus' name, amen.
at the table of the Lord, as we know in the Gospels, especially the uh, Gospel of John, there is so much there, starting in 13, preparation for that Last Supper, Passover meal. Jesus is about to identify his betrayer. And uh, he speaks to them and he uses phrases that I, I was just using to describe him as, as I am, that I am he, that I am he. The disciples were definitely perplexed. In verse 19 of chapter 13, he says, Now I tell you, before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you will believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives, whomever I send, receives me. And he who receives me, receives him who sent me. When Jesus said these things, he was troubled in the spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. What a sad dinner arrangement that is. Then the disciples looked at one another perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was one leaning on Jesus, on Jesus' bosom, who, who one leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. And Peter, Simon Peter, therefore motioned to him to ask who it was whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? I don't want to go any further because it takes away from the whole scene, the whole uh, sense of what that song was just all about because that's where that song came out of. I want to sit at your feet. I want to lean on you. I want to drink from your cup. And this was describing John. John was leaning on him. He was close to him. And I, and I, and I loved how John just kind of, a little bit of humility here or clandestine pride <laughs> says, the one, who, the one who loved Jesus, the one who Jesus loved and he loved him. Uh, he didn't say, you know, and I, John. He, he was leaning on him. He was close to him. And, and I mean, the, uh, I don't want to be too, too rude, but the, the mutton Jeff of the disciples, Peter and John. <laughs> you know, there is such a powerful personality difference in the two. And there were just all of them were concerned about, is it I? Is it I? Who is it? Who is it? But just to take that moment, and that's what we do right now when we're celebrating communion, it's not just, a, it's not a ritual. It's not even, I don't want to say it's not just a ritual. It's not a ritual. It's a habit. It's something that we do. And, um, and I like in moments like this that we could take the time and just slow down enough to, to realize what the table was, was meaning for us and, and what the cross of Christ has done for us. And, and, uh, and as I shared with, with you with Mephibosheth, you know, he was welcomed at the, the table of the king. He was a, a relative of Jonathan, and, and uh, Jonathan and Saul were gone, and David's heart was to restore what was you know, perceived maybe that it was taken. You know, and, and the benevolence of, of King David, the beloved of God, wanted to restore unto Mephibosheth everything that was Jonathan's. Everything. What a, what a blessing that is. You know, that... King David realized the kingdom was only his because it belonged to the Lord and you cannot outgive God and God's not broke and I want to give, I want to, give to, to Mephibosheth what is, what is his and you are welcomed at the table of the king. I don't know if you're feeling broken, you're feeling shamed, you're feeling put out, and you're feeling sidestepped, you're feeling betrayed by the family name or you know, whatever would kind of tie into who you are you know, as, as a Mephibosheth because there's times where I think all of us feel that way but I want you to hear the invitation. Come to the table. Come to the table. There's no one that can be there's no one that would be rejected that would come to the table that comes to the table in the name of the Lord for the reasons of the Lord with the heart of the Lord. And that's why we have Corinthians where Paul wrote, you know, that I'm going to write you some things that are harsh, you know, that we need to examine ourselves. We come to this table. And it's not crawling through glass or crawling up an aisle to, oh God, I'm so ashamed. 
you know, we need to be shamed by the things that we do wrong, but at the same time, church, we need to know that we're forgiven in Christ. If we repent, repentance is agreeing with God. I'm agreeing with you. Confession is I agree with what you say. And what's the thing that Jesus says to us? You know, he says, I am, but, but he also says, I'm the way, and I'm the truth, I'm the life. He, he's, you know, he said he's going to be the sacrifice. Well, sacrifice is for sinners. So by receiving his sacrifice, what are you admitting? I'm a sinner, saved by grace, man. I'm no longer defined as that. I'm a saint now. You a saint? I'm a saint. You know, we don't like to say that because it's like, is that a prideful thing? Saint, sanctified, set aside for Jesus being perfected into the image of Christ because ain't none of it done yet. But we come and we celebrate what he has done for us through the cross. Jesus' journey to the cross and his crucifixion was the fulfillment of his purpose on earth. He was making a way for us to be free and also to be uh, intimate with him in relationship with God. He had referenced this time many times declaring that he was a gate through which we could be saved. He was the only way of salvation. In John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And through the sacrifice that we have in Christ Jesus, listen to this phrase, through the rugged cross and an empty tomb, we discover that we are made new. We need to remember this day and every day forward that Jesus, Jesus, has impacted our lives that way, and then we give him our life. This, the, this phrase is today, let us remember that who Jesus is has deepened, a deepening and lasting impact on who we are. This thing that we were talking about in the room earlier, it, it had just something that we can declare, and, and I want us to do this. I want to say a phrase and then we can repeat it after me, you know, because of, of, of who he is to each one of us. He shapes our lives. He, the I am's are our truths. Church, truth is under attack. Truth is being renamed. I'm going to give you some definitions that are going to be crazy to you because it's about relativism and, and, and truth that changes and, and that there's no absolutes. When people say that there's no absolutes, what they're trying to do is have a foundation, which is sloppy as it could be because it's built on sand. If you say that there's no absolute, there's no absolute truth, then there is no absolute God. Because he is truth. Amen? These are some of the I am's that we have. Because he is the resurrection, I am alive. Because he is the resurrection, I'm alive. Declare that. Because he is the resurrection, I'm alive. Amen? Because he is the bread of life, I am made whole. Because he is the way, I am made new. Because he is the Lamb of God, I am saved and redeemed. This is what we declare through this table. We are saved by grace through faith. There's a a faith factor that comes in, and the world wants to shy away from that faith factor because it takes a vulnerability, a transparency, and an openness to what God wants. And mankind has always been trying to, they try to put God away. But there's a bunch of us, globally, Judeo-Christians that love the Lord, that will stand for absolute truth, no matter what it costs us. Amen? Amen. Lord, today we come to you and we want to grab this bread. We want to grab this cup. And I use the word grab, Lord, because once we have it in our hands, it's, it's kind of possession of ownership here. Lord, I want to just set it back down on the table and grab you. I grab you, Lord. I want to embrace you, Lord. Let us be as John that we would lean back on you. We would listen to your heartbeat, Lord. We would listen to your breathing in and out. Have that personal, intimate time with you, God. We know that that meal that was being shared, that it was going to have a whole new meaning after the crucifixion. 
than after the resurrection for sure. After the ascension, and then you, by your spirit, falling upon a room of scared, bewildered, confused disciples that walked with you, students that walked with you, and you empowered them, and they were never the same. Boldness came out of fear. Confidence was in the face of threat. Assurance was there, even though there might be an uncertainty of life because of who you are in us. And today, Lord, we can declare these things. We are alive because you are alive. Old hymnals have those songs in there. You know, we live, we live because of you in us. And Lord, what is it that you require of us this day? Lord, I ask you that our hearts be open to what it is that you call us to, first and foremost. Lord, firstly, it's to have a relationship with you, to admit that I'm a sinner saved by grace. I am now a saint that's being perfected and made into the image of you. We need you, Jesus. We declare this as we receive this table. As you gave it to the disciples, take this bread that is broken for you. Eat this. This is the this is the bread of my body. As often as you do this, do this in memory of me, in remembrance. Lord, we remember your brokenness. We remember how you were tore apart. We remember that you referred to yourself as the bread of life. Sustenance, spiritual nutrition. Dear Lord, you are what we need. Let's take of the bread together. Thank you, Jesus. In like manner, when the supper was near completed, you took the cup, you made declarations. We want to drink from your cup. Your love is so real. I want to sit at your feet. Lord, the disciples had to be so silent at that moment just listening to you as you picked up the cup of redemption and prayed, giving thanks, giving thanks for what was in your heart, what was in your mind, what were in the words. You're giving thanks for what that cup was going to do, what it represented, and what was going to take place through you. Mock trials, beatings, bleedings, death, burial, and resurrection. You're giving thanks because of what was beyond the cross. Let us never lose sight of what's what that is. But sometimes we get beyond the cross and we look at all the things in life instead of looking back because it says when we remember you, when we remember the bread, when we remember the cup, we declare your death and your burial till you come. Lord, we know that you rose from the dead and you appeared before them and you made fish for them on the water, next to the water. We know that, that you were there, but Lord, also throughout the New Testament, we see that there was still a declaration remembering what the cost was. Declaring the death and the burial. Lord, I ask you that we would be men and women that would not boast about what you've done for us. We would boast about you. You took that cup and gave thanks. Take this, all of you. This is the, new, this is the cup of, uh, of the new covenant that I'm making with you, the new and everlasting covenant. Drink this, and as often as you do, do this in remembrance of me. Thank you for your sacrifice for us. Now, Lord, we know this, this is a grape juice that we, can, that we consume, Lord, and we remember how the grape got into the cup, what it went through, the picking, the crushing, the squeezing, 
the tribulum that it went through for us. That's what you've done for us. Lord, thank you for this great sacrifice. Thank you for this great gift. Lord, let us be now responsible with this great gift, this great privilege. In Jesus' name, let's take the cup. Lord, have your will in your way as we pray all the time into and through us. Whatever we do, whether in word or in deed, that we would do it wholeheartedly unto you. Colossians 3, 17 and 23. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, good morning. Let's go to Peg's. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I love doing communion with y'all. This is just a, a privilege that we have just to continue to celebrate who we are in Christ. Amen. Um, yeah. Got some announcements to make. Uh, we were going to have a, a birthday party for Marlene, but she's staying home today. Uh, so what we can do is, is uh, uh, sneak in a bunch of birthday hugs and, uh, and love on, on Bill Lavelle because his birthday is the 7th. So make sure you say something to Billy and go, go sing out a tune to him later, okay? So that's it. We need to do that. Uh, this morning, if you have your bulletin, please look at it. We've got a couple things we want to uh, share with you. Today is a Calvary Connect, so if you're new and you want to hang out, meet a couple of leadership, myself and Kelly, my wife, and we'll talk to you a little bit more about the, um, just kind of some of the fundamentals of the church and who we're all about, and you can ask questions. Uh, we want to thank you all. The, the blood drive was, a, they got 13 units, which means 39 people uh, will, will have life. There's a ladies' Bible study that, that, start, that has started, so uh, get, in, get involved with that. Um, and it's not too late. Uh, you know, standalone teachings, but there's a book you can catch up on it. So, uh, yeah. There's, a, um, there's a, a scam, in, a, a senior scam that's going on. It's, I think it's going on everywhere because people try to scam you with your internet and phone and all this kind of stuff. Um, there's a series that's being offered um, for seniors at the Carson City Senior Center. And we try to do as much as we can to get this information into your hands as well as other people's hands. So if you know somebody that needs this, please pass this information on. You know, there's times periodically that we will have... Um, the, the widow's group uh, uh, have, have a, a, a police officer or a deputy or a retired deputy come and share with them how to stay safe, what to look for, because, you know, your, your, your targets as we get weaker, older, uh, the eyes dimming, not paying attention like we should, we can get scammed on. Uh, but uh, this is a series. National Consumer Protection Week is, is, starts today and it goes all the way through the night. These are free things that are there. How to recognize and prevent scams. Um, emails and links, uh, real or fake, uh, local scams targeting seniors. On, the, uh, on March 5, 7, and 8, uh, these things are going to be offered at the Carson City, uh, Carson City Senior Center Joshua Tree Room um, that, that are going to be there. There's going to be uh, at the Senior Center in, in the Nevada Room, and then those two rooms are going to be used. So these, these flyers will be out in the back. So if you know somebody that needs this and can be there, these are at 1230. Um, a.m. on 5 and 7, and then 10 a.m. on Friday the 8th for these different classes that will be there uh, to equip you not to get scammed, not to get scammed. And if you're not sure of something, please, please, something comes on your phone, do what I do. I call youth in. What is this? And, you know, or I call somebody who knows how to, you know, what is it? Don't click on that. That's what I hear more often, and don't, no, don't open that. If you, know, if you get something in your email or you get something on your phone, you don't recognize the number, delete it. Delete it. You know, it's, well, what if somebody's trying to get a hold of me? Yeah, somebody's trying to get a hold of you, trying to get a hold of your wallet. You know, I mean, if, if they, you know, and folks, we need to let our families know that and our friends know that. Say, man, if I don't have your number in my phone, I'm not answering the phone. You know, send a smoke signal or something. But, you know, we need, but you need, to, you know, we need to be careful because it's just, it's out there. It's bad. Okay. If you need a Bible, put your hand in the air. We want to put one in your lap to follow along with where we're going to be teaching. We're going to be in Micah, Micah chapter 6, and also um, Hebrews chapter 4. As I go on with some of these uh, announcements, we've got Daylight Savings coming up, Good Friday service, please mark your calendar, Easter, uh, 10 a.m., 
uh, is going to be on the, th- on the 31st, so come and celebrate with us on that. Men's Breakfast coming up. Uh, guys, uh, me- uh, at Men's Breakfast, is going to be a fun one this, this time. We've got a couple things going on. It'll be a great teaching. And then that bus that's out there, the Life Choices bus, we get a private tour of it. We get a, pr- a little private showing, so that's kind of cool. But because we're guys, we go second. We open the door for the ladies. The ladies get to do that first. They get to do that first. On Tuesday nights, ladies, I, I want you to see what's in, in, the, in here. This Tuesday, March 5th at 6 p.m., you're going to be gather, gathering, and it's, and it's a Life Choices baby shower. It's an opportunity to walk through the mobile medical unit. Uh, please sign up in the fellowship hall. Ladies, I, you know, I, I know that you, you, you know, there's times where we just, well, I don't know if I want to go to that. It's super important that we know what's going on in our community, how we can help somebody who's in a crisis pregnancy, you know, uh, young, you know young, young couples that are there or, you know, a, a mom and that she's freaked out on what she's going to do, that you can go through some of these things, get some answers. It's an opportunity for us. You, you say, what's this up here for? Oh, in case my grandchildren show up. Uh, no. Um, this is, this is, you know, we want to see this thing filled with, you know, clothing and diapers and stuff like that that we can give to Life Choices and, and bless them with, with what they're doing for the unsaved, for the, uh, or for, for the unborn, I mean, so that they have an opportunity uh, to... to to breathe, breathe life in, in, or breathe air in this life and, and have an opportunity to receive Christ. Amen? So that's, you know, that's what we want. So don't miss out on that. Don't miss out on it. Say, well, you know, well, it's not my cup of tea. It's like, it is your cup of tea. And I can tell you why. Because pure and undefiled religion, pure and undefiled relationship with the Lord, as it says in James chapter 1, verse 27, pure and undefiled religion in Christ towards God is what? Take care of the widows and the orphan in their time of need and keep yourself from being polluted by the things of this world. Two things. It's like, wow, that's kind of just trims it right down. Takes all the fat off of that, right? Right here. And so, well, how does that deal with this? Because the, the most orphaned kids that we see are the ones that haven't been thrown away yet, haven't been abandoned yet. Haven't been orphaned yet. They're, they're in the, supposed to be the safest place on the planet, I would think, is in the womb. But they're going to be they're going to be not just orphaned, but they're going to be murdered. I'm not shy about this, you guys. You know, these are lives. These are little tiny human lives. You want to you know you want to hold up a poster, my you know my you know my body, my rights. Say, yeah, do what you want on yours. Cut it up, tattoo it up, punch it out. I mean, take a whip and beat yourself. If you, but the, the life that's in the woman, that's not your life. So that life has rights also. That little child in there can say, my body, my right. That would be awesome. Well, I, I don't want to harp on that too much more, but I just, can I get, I mean, that's a, you guys... We need to stand up for the unborn. We need to stand up for the unborn. You know, we can get into all kinds of debates. Well, what about this happened? What about that happens? And, and just, you know, it's like we can, we can go on for a month of Sundays, as Mama used to say, debating these things. You know, um, we're going to get to a, a place in a teaching today, but I, I just want to jump ahead to it. And at UCLA, a professor posed this question to his medical ethics class. Medical ethics class. How would you advise, he said, the following patient concerning the pregnancy and the possibility of terminating this pregnancy? Here is the scenario. The father has syphilis. The mother has tuberculosis. The first child was born blind. The second child died at childbirth. The third child was born deaf. The fourth child contracted tuberculosis. Now the mother is pregnant again. How would you advise Mr. and Mrs. Medical Ethic Community, what would you say? 70% of the students said, that woman should abort that child. Aren't you glad I didn't do a show of hands? Congratulations, said the professor. Bravo, said the professor. For what you have just done is aborted Beethoven. Like, 
Huh? It's not ours to decide. That, that blew my mind the first time I heard that. Because most people would say, well, yeah, I can see why yeah, you kind of be leaning toward that. And we start getting chipped away at and chipped away at and chipped away at because we have what is called, this is called, you know what this is called, the term for this? Situational ethics. Our ethics of morality, right and wrong, are based on situational things. It's like, does the situation change anything? No, there, no, it does not change anything. You know, the world wants to say, well, there's some things that are unchangeable. There's some things that are unchangeable. You, you, can't, you can't get a square out of a circle. You can't get a circle out of a circle. I mean, just crazy stuff. Like, church, there, there are things that are absolutes. We have to have absolutes. Before we go too much further, I want to start off with just... Uh, Start off with turning to the, to the book of Hebrews with me. I know you're in Micah. But go to Hebrews chapter 4, will you please? You say, well, I don't know what to decide. I don't, I don't know what to do. There's confusion here. And, you know, what, what do we do? And, and I just want to remind us of something. Because we're going to be studying through the book of Hebrews. And I'm going to jump, jump forward to, to chapter 4. Chapter 4. Chapter 4, starting in verse 14, says this. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are tempted, yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now, for the last couple weeks, we've been kind of springboarding into the the, the study in Hebrews, and and I keep having that Chuck Swindoll uh, quote come up that, only when we give Jesus the rightful place in our lives, everything else will fall into the place. We have to have him first. You know, we need to remember the descriptions of Christ. He is the great I am, yes, but he's the heir. He's a creator, revealer, sustainer, redeemer, ruler, and he is supreme. And here we have this great heir, creator, revealer, sustainer, redeemer, ruler, and supreme. He is our great high priest. He passed through the heavens. He passed through the heavens. Jesus is the Son of God. He can sympathize with our weakness on all points. When we don't know an answer, we can go to the answer. Go to the answer. At all points was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, that therefore, isn't that great? Therefore, because of him, because of what he's done, we can come boldly to the throne. We can come boldly to the throne. I mean, you know, it's just, you know, when, when, when my little granddaughter Kennedy's at the house, and when I walk in the house, and I've shared kind of similar stories with the other ones when they were this young, and, you know, they, they, hear, they hear my voice. I just, I love that moment. Because all you hear, Papa! And she just runs and just dives into my legs. You know, it's just like she's running to me. She's coming boldly. No inhibitions, man. You know, she could have just got a spanking for something. <laughs> but now Papa's here, man. Things are good. You know, just, he's going to grab a hold because there's this, this relationship that we have. And, and we can come boldly. You know, and I've watched her become, you know, have, have correction from mom. And then, you know, two minutes later, mom will say something and she'll run to mom boldly. Because she knows that even though correction was there, mom loves me dearly. We have this in Christ Jesus. We can come boldly before him. We become boldly before him. You know, I've had a couple of different things that I wanted to, you know, title this this, this morning. But, you know, it, it, there's a, in Micah, in the book of Micah, uh, he a prophet, contemporary of the day, Hosea, Isaiah, you know, and, and what was going on, Israel was just, you know, messing up all the time. And, and it's because I think they forgot who they are in Christ, who, or who they were in God, and how, how they got to where they are. And I think, that, you know, uh, the, there's a, a mock trial, if you would, that, that is in here on chapter 6. And, and I think, you know, 
we could have that same thing said to America. Said to America, if the Lord was going to put us on trial, you know, what would it sound like? What would it be like? And I'm thinking that, that we would have similar things that would, be, that would be being said to us through the book of Micah. Let me grab these other notes here. <clears throat> Bugger. It's, here's the mock trial, if you would, or the imitation or the, the imaginary trial, that, you know, because it's been said that it was that way at times. It was, you know, this is what it would be like. The Lord is pleading a case. If he's putting Israel on trial, if he'd put America on trial, what would he say? Hear now what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains. Now, if God would say, America, listen, I want to, I want to call you into the courtroom. Plead your case. Speak to these. These mountains are going to be your witnesses. They're, they're immovable. They can't move them. These hills are going to hear your voice. Hear you, O mountains, the complaint of the Lord. Because the Lord is saying, and before the mountains also. I want to hear the response of the people, but here's what I'm saying. Now here says the Lord, arise, plead your case. Plead your case. You know, the Lord's complaint, and you strong foundations of the earth. And the Lord has a complaint against his people, and he will contend with Israel as well as anyone else that disobeys him. Oh, my people, what I have done for you, what have I done to you? What have I done to you? Can you imagine? I'm just, you know, folks, I'm kind of passionate about this today. I mean, if America, if the Lord said that, what have I done to you to get this kind of treatment? What have I done? You know, and he'd go back and tell us, you know, show us all the faithfulness of him and the pilgrims and coming over here and freedom of, 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 of the faith that we have and the freedom of religion, getting away from a tyrannical king and, and coming and say, we serve no king but Jesus and having the foundations and blessing America for the last couple hundred years. And we're like, and now we're where, we're, where we're at? The Lord would say, what did I do to deserve that? Why? Hey, are you following me? Okay, good. <laughs> kind of quiet out there. So is he mad? I'm not mad. I'm kind of excited about this. You know, and then he tells him, all my people, what I've done for you. Well, you know, what? Uh, and how have I wearied you? What did I, you know, what am I requiring of you? I mean, there's just the, the laws and the things that I've given to you are for, for your benefit. They're good. But, you know, maybe they were overwhelming. Testify against me. For I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I redeemed you out of the house of bondage. I took you out from underneath a tyrannical king. You know, if we're going to throw America in there. I set before you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Oh, my people, remember what now what Balak king Moab, of Moab counseled. And what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from a Acacia Grove to Gilgal, that you may know the, righteous, the righteousness of the Lord. So we, we see that. We see this, this first thing that takes place, the, the summons. The Lord summons them, and, and, and then he gives this complaint against them, and, and it's you know, before these mountains, and he's ready for, for them to answer back. He's ready for us to answer back. You know, what have I done to deserve this? And this would be the answer back. With what shall we come before the Lord and, and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with, with thousands of, of rams, 10,000 10, rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn from, you know, for my transgression, for the fruit of my body, for the, for the sin of my soul? I mean, it's just like, you know, the, the Lord is calling them into attention. They're, he's calling them into a place of accountability. He's calling them to a place where he, he, can, he can talk to them and, and, and maybe not even reason with them, as it were, but, but just say, you know, where were you when I did things? You know, remember, the, remember the, uh, the, the Job 38? Where were you when I spread out all these mounds? Where were you? Where were you? You know, God is a creator of all things, and here's, he's calling into question. And then the answer is back, you know, this, you know, should we do this, should we do this, should we do this, should we do this? So that's the complaint. And the people's reply was, you know, what should we do, should we do this, should we do this? And, and then we see the Lord's reply. We see the Lord's reply, and his reply has been the same from the beginning all the way to now. He's made it a whole lot simpler for a whole lot of us. But he says this. He has shown thee, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly 
with thy God. You know, Kelly and I and a bunch of us have been singing that song for years and years and years. And I mean, I just, I just love it. He has shown thee, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee. It's just a beautiful sounding song, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. It's like, oh. I like to bellow it, but I, I don't want to mess it up too much. But he has shown thee. Church, he has shown us. He has declared to us. He has expounded to us. This is what this word means when you look at, when you dig into the, what does it mean to be shown? especially something that you did not understand before as if it was concealed or mysterious. I've made this conspicuous. That's what the Lord, I've shown you. I have shown you what's good, what's pleasant, what's of a higher nature, what's good, pleasing to me, what's giving in pleasure, happiness, prosperity, what is agreeable, what is well-pleasing, what is appropriate and pleasant and agreeable and good to me. I have shown you, O oh man, what is good and what is pleasant? What is good? The Lord has shown you what the Lord requires. I love the name here of the Lord, Yahweh. Yahweh. Just say that. Don't you like that? Yahweh. And I think that's why I said for, you know, for years and years now, man, it's not my way, but it's Yahweh. Not my way, but Yahweh. To do justly, to do proper, to do what is fitting. And he's speaking in words through the prophet to a people group that were abusing their positions and their powers and their authorities and their rank. And he was calling, you are not doing justly. You're lavishing yourself with the people's sweat of their brow. So he's calling them. This is what, the, what prophets do. They call out these things. I want you to do proper. I want you to do fitting. I want you to do righteous. I want you to do this. Not just, well, you know, I could tell you what justice is, can you? But can you do it? Can you do justly? When you're wrong, do you do justly? Do we act like the Lord? Love others as he has loved us. To love mercy. I love this. Love mercy, kindness especially to the extending of to the person who is lowly, needing and, lowly needy and miserable. Because <laughs> when you're lowly and needy, and you're, you become miserable. To show them mercy, kindness towards each other. That's something that you would do that would be favorable or beneficial. To love it. Not just know it, but to love it. Well, I could be merciful. It's like, but do you love it when you're being merciful? Mercy, you know, it's not getting what you do, you know, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. And I love doing that. It's like, oh, no, I don't. I would love to give you what you deserve. And we do, and it's just a, it's a thing that we need to call into attention, but Lord, how do you, you want to use me in this? How do you see me in this? What have, you, what have I done for you, and what have you done for me? And remembering how he's restored us. To love it, to, to literally, I like doing this to walk humbly, to proceed forward, to move forward, to walk forward in modesty and lowliness of who we are in him. With thy God. With God. I mean, do you get, to, you get that? We get to do this with God. Listen to this with me. When, when you look this up, the, the depth of the meaning behind this is in fellowship with him, in companionship with him, in the action of doing something jointly with him, accompanying him. He's not accompanying us, by the way. We accompany him. We go where he says go. Jesus, even obedience to the Father, said, I only do and say what I see, see and, and hear my Father say. We're supposed to walk in that kind of obedience, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God, to walk in companionship with him, to walk alongside with him, to be before and beside him. That is just an amazing thing. So we see in the first couple of verses, there was a summons, there was a complaint, there was a response, and then there was the definition of it. There was this definition that was there. 
You know, I want to share with you even some of what Spurgeon, when Spurgeon was looking at this thing called true humility. What is true humility? True humility is to be able to walk in who we really are. Spurgeon says this, true humility is thinking rightly of thyself. You know, when you look in the mirror, you can't look in the mirror and say, I am all that. Because that guy looking back at you or that gal looking back at you, he's saying, oh, you know you ain't. You think you're all that. You're trying to get people to think you're all that. But when we're in Christ Jesus, he's all that. He's the one who's all that. And when we're in a right place with that, we start exuding the love, the grace, the mercy, the compassion of Christ onto others because as he has loved us, so love others. Do unto others. As the Lord has done unto us. W.C. Fields had some stuff to say about that. Do unto others what they've done unto you and then split. No, that's not mercy and grace. True humility is thinking rightly of yourself. Old, you know, old terminology, as Spurgeon would say it, true humility is thinking rightly of thyself, not meanly. When you have found out what you really are, you are humble. It's like there's other terminology when we stand bare before the Lord. We start walking humbly. Not humiliated, because God does not humiliate us. He wants us to walk in humility, which is a positioning. I'm walking in honor, respect of you, Lord, and I see who I am in you, with you, but I can also see who I am without you, and that defines me. I see who I am. I found out who I really am, and I am humbled. He says this, when you find out who you really are, you will be humble, for you are nothing to boast of. To be humble will make you safe. To be humble will make you happy. To be humble will make you have music in your heart when you go to bed. To be humble to be humble here will make you wake up in the likeness of your master in the by and by. He summed up in an outline the entire book of Micah by saying this. And he called it, it's a sermon that Spurgeon wrote, it's called Micah's Message for Today. And it was about walking humbly. Walk humbly when you're spiritually strong. Walk humbly when you have much work to do. Walk humbly in all of your motives. Walk humbly in studying God's word. Walk humbly when in trials. Walk humbly in your devotions. Walk humbly between you and your brothers in Christ. Walk humbly in dealing with sinners. Pastor Guzik said this, in Micah, the prophets imagined a, cla- a courtroom given by God, proving his case before the court. Israel was afflicted But not because Israel was neglected or discarded by God. Their own sin brought their own affliction upon them. In addition, what God required of them was not mysterious. It was not difficult. They just simply didn't do it. It's like, oh, Lord. You know, Micah was talking about but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. To know the word of God. I mean, God's heart was revealed 300 years prior to that King David. King David wrote some things like this. He said, to the chief musician, Psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. The firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day he utters speeches. Night unto night he reveals knowledge. There is no speech, no language where their voice is not heard. Their line has been gone through in the, through the earth, and their words to the the words to the end of the earth. In them, he has set a tabernacle for his son, for a son S U N, which is like a bridegroom coming out of the chamber, his chamber, and rejoices in a, uh, and rejoices like a strong man running its race, running his race. He rises from one end of the heavens, and its circuit to the other end. 
and there's nothing hidden from his heart. And then David says this about the law of the Lord, the rules of God, the things that he's done. What does the Lord require? Well, the Lord requires us to look into his perfect law. And his perfect law does several things, church. The perfect law of the Lord is, it says, the law of the Lord is perfect for converting a soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure for making simple, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than than gold, yea, more than fine gold, sweeter than honey and honeycomb. Moreover, by them, by them, what do you require of me? Lord, by them, you said... That if the servant, if your servant is warned, and in keeping them, there's great reward. The problem here, church, what I see in, you know, in, in Psalm 19, Psalm 19 here is, is that we, we, we know a lot of them, but are we keeping all of them? Like, I can't keep all of them. There's 613 of them in the Old Testament. Holy smokes. I was talking to a bunch of guys about this very thing yesterday, man. The Lord's like... Okay, you guys, yeah, it's probably way too much for you to remember. So, but, but in keeping them, we have great reward. And I love that the King David says this, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Keep me back. Keep your servant back from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall walk innocent of great transgression. Listen to this praise. Listen to this proclamation. Listen to this, pre, this plea. Listen to this practice verse of life, church. This is a practice verse of life, not just for all of us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let your perfect law look into me, Lord. Let your perfect law look into me. David you know, spoke that in 19, but in 15 we have this, that he's looking at, he takes 613 and, and just kind of condenses them down into 11, the Psalm of David. Who can abide in your, hill, in your tabernacle? Who can dwell in your holy hill? This is, you, know, you can go to Psalm 24 and it sounds similar to that. Who can, who can even approach you? Well, he who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He does not backbite with his tongue nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up the reproach against a friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised. But he honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt and does not change. He who does not put out his money for usury, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall not be moved. Shall not be moved. It says, shall never shall never be moved. He shall never be moved. This is absolutely amazing to me that, that it gets down to you know, what, what the world wants to do is they want to change things. They want to the, take away the simplicity of it. You could take it from 613 down to 11 here. You could take it down to three that we see in Micah. But to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with the Lord. That's three. It takes it down to three. James, as I already told you, takes it down to two. This, this how, how should we live? Taking care of the widows and the orphans in time of trouble. Keep yourself from being polluted by the things of the world. These are practical things that we do. But Jesus, when he was approached by the Pharisees, the Pharisees were put to shame, so they had a lawyer come. Do lawyers, do lawyers seek for justice? Just a question. Just a question. We always talk bad about lawyers. When a lawyer's hired, he's hired to represent the law. Now, we would think as Christians that the law and justice are kind of like the same thing. Not anymore. Lawyers are hired to figure out a ways to beat the law, get around the law, or keep the law. But justice, that's why the Lord, he didn't say, you know, keep the law. He said, do justly. So they tried to trap Christ. They get a lawyer to trap Christ. It's like, okay. Master, out of all the laws, what's the most important one? The Lord dwindles it down to two, which is actually one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. This is the first and Greatest commandment. And the second is like it. I can, I can imagine that he didn't even take a breath because he didn't want to be interrupted. 
Because a lot of times people are just waiting for your mouth to stop so they, they can interject what they're going to say. That's not true communication. So if you're practicing that in your marriage or in your friendships, don't just wait for the mouth to stop so you can fill in what you want to fill in. Stop, think, listen to what's being said, formulate an opinion after everything's been said. That's communication. So this is, so the Lord listened to the question and he answered. So here it is. Here's the greatest. Love God with everything you got. And the second one's like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So what did the Lord do? He dwindled it down to two, which is actually one. Represent the love of God, which is an absolute church. I told you that there, you know, there's things that, that are out there right now. You look up, you can go into, into your phone and say, you know, how are we, what is this justice? How are we supposed to do this? What is to do justice and love mercy? Moral law, listen to what it says here. Moral law refers to conduct derived from an object of right or wrong. Moral law refers to, refers to a higher set of principles that should govern and conduct that which is necessarily set down by legislation. Instead, moral law, not set down by legislation, instead, moral law appeals typically to a theory of natural law or a set of religious laws like the canon. So in, in the wor- this is a worldly thing. This is a worldly definition. In theory. It's like, <laughs> there's no theory about him. I mean, theology is the study of God. He's not a theory. But what the world wants to do is they say, well, what is truth? What is this? What is, what is this truth? Well, no, they want to say it's, it's truth is relative. Relative truth is a conditional, subjective to the very contradiction, so, so it's capable of changing over time. It's in contrast, absolute, in contrast, check this out, in contrast, absolute truth is consistent, eternal, and meaning is universal and never changing. Yeah, that's real truth. That's real truth, and we're to represent that real truth, but we're supposed to represent that real truth with the love of God. Love God with everything you got. Love your neighbor, love others, and don't think that it cha- that changes. It, ju- it doesn't change over time. It doesn't change when, th- when the situation changes. It's like the difference between a contract and, and, a, and a covenant. When somebody says, well, we got a marriage license, it's like, mm, that's kind of weak. You got a marriage covenant. When you have a marriage covenant, when new circumstances occur, it doesn't change a thing. Your commitment, your covenant, it's the same. This is a covenant. This cannot be broken. This is the new and everlasting covenant that we received at the communion table. Take this, all of you. This is my body, broken for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Take this cup, all of you. Drink of this. He handed the disciples. I want to drink from your cup. Take this. And then he says, what's our marching orders? What's their marching orders? Here, take this. Remember, this is a cup of the new and everlasting covenant that I'm making with you. New and everlasting. Well, what does the Lord require? Now, if we're in that court of law, we're in the, we're in the kind of the defendant thing. Okay, Lord, what do you require of me? I already told you, Pat. Do justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with me. What about all the other laws? If you're doing justly and you're loving mercy, you're going to be walking humbly with me. You'll be fulfilling all of those other laws. You'll, be, you'll just be doing it. You know, we look at all the, I mean, the 613, it's just such a trip because every, well, that's just restrictive. It's like it kept them alive. I was reading in a, in a course in commentary that he had said that, that there was a study that was done by our government at one time trying to figure out why there's so much rampant viruses and sickness and, and all kind of stuff that was going on. So what they did is they did a study on Old Testament requirements cleansing laws and all these kind of things. And they came up and said, huh, no wonder they didn't have all these diseases that they were swapping back and forth. They weren't living in sin. They were doing all these things. There was something that was just like, hmm, we better just, how many, how many saw that publication? It's like, can't do that. But it was just amazing that they went to the Hebrew old, old restrictions that, well, how are these dietary laws? What's that all about? How are these moral laws that they were, oh, that's moral absolutes. You can't have that. Moral, mor- morality is an absolute. Yes, it is, because it's based in truth. Not relative truth. It's based on truth. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And ain't nobody coming on to the Father except through him. That's my hillbilly side of that. One, through him. 
Ah, oh, there's more, there's many ways to heaven. It's like, no, there's many ways to the top of the mountain. You still got to get from the mountain up into the heavens. And that's through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. He's the way, truth, and life. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the study that we have before us, Lord. We thank you for this court case that was there. That, Lord, that we would walk in a humble dependency upon you, Lord. A humble dependency upon you. Lord, even as, as I was sharing this yesterday, the, the unique word that came out of that, that particular verse in Scripture, on these two commandments hangs the entire law. Lord, I don't think that was a coincidence. I don't think hangs was a word even in that day that was a coincidence. It was suspended on. It relies on. It's hinged to because that's you, Lord. You, you hung between heaven and earth. Everything that we need for life and godliness is found in you. Everything that we need to learn through life and godliness is found in your word. You are the word. The word became flesh. Now the word lives in us. Lord, I ask you that we would be representatives of that, of your word. That, Lord, that we would be transformed by your word. That we would be renewed, remade by your word. Because of what you've done for us, God. Lord, I ask you that we would become more and more and more passionate. With our relationships singularly in you. And then, yes, Lord, collectively as a church. But, Lord, that we would walk with you humbly, in companionship with you, beside you. And Lord, I, I know that when, when we're beside somebody that we take confidence and strength, and we might be beside them, but you're taking the lead, Lord. You take the lead. And we'll follow you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Or let's stand and worship the Lord. I just pray. God bless you. <laughs> You are my deliverer, the freedom I'm living in. You are my deliverer, you are my promised land. You are my deliverer, the freedom I'm living in. You are my deliverer, you are my promised land. You are my deliverer, the freedom I'm living in. You are my deliverer, you are my promised land. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Sing of his promises evermore. Pour out your faithfulness and let it overflow. When Kel and I were pretty young, we, were, uh, we would do these youth encounters and, and, uh, and retreats and, and whatnot. And that song, would, that, song, that song's that old. It's been around for a long time. And there was this precious, precious woman. I think, it, I think that she, she brought it to, to that whole new level. It was, her name is Izzy, Izzy Vijo. And, and I just remember, that's where I learned it from. So I don't know where she learned it from or she's the one that came up with it. We would sing that song and you'd say, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You'd hear Izzy, So! <laughs> she would just shout it out, So! Because she wanted, I'm going to, so let's do that. A couple, so just shout out, So, okay? Let the 
may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Have a